Hello everyone and welcome to this Aim High Live. This one is about um, soil. Can soil save our species? Thanks so much for coming. Um, this is going to be uh, one where I really, really want people to ask questions because I, um, I've i covered a few things on soil before and so I'm going to kind of recover some of those things. Uh, but also I'm really keen to know uh, what 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 extra things you want to know because soil is something I've spent a lot of time um, studying and so you can ask me anything and I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can handle it. So yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, hey Pangolin, Izzy, Pumpkin Master, LDBR, let's, uh, let's go straight into this screen. So, um, can soil save our species? But first, how do dragonflies breathe? And I ask this because I met a dragonfly um, only yesterday uh, in the wind. And oh, in fact, shall I? I'm gonna I'm gonna show you guys the 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 video of me of me meeting the dragonfly. Let's start with that. Um, here you go. I'm gonna just turn on sound so you guys can hear this. This is a dragonfly. This one's on holiday, but it's gone a bit lost. So I've uh, got it on my finger, and I'm about to take it back to the resort. Um, did you know that uh, back in the day, so millions of years ago, when there was way more oxygen, um, there used to be dragonflies almost as big as horses, and they used to breathe through a bit that's kind of like, I used to think it was under their armpits, but actually it's over. I feel like someone just asked if I ate it. I didn't eat it. Did I say that I was going to eat dragonfly? <laughs> I don't think I said that. But anyway, um... Uh, uh, I think I actually said in that how dragonflies breathe, in which case the question is already answered. Um, so I, I couldn't hear it while I was saying it. But uh, I think I explained how I used to think the dragonflies breathed underneath their armpits in little holes, but actually it's kind of more above their arms that they have these little, little holes that they breathe through. Uh, now, there was a time in the past when dragonflies were a lot, lot bigger. So you had dragonflies about the same size as um, as horses, so you had like horse-sized dragonflies. When was that, and why? Why did dragonflies used to be the size of horses? What was going on? Ah, the pumpkin master's just said um, that dragonflies might have six legs, but they can't walk, which seems a bit insulting. Yeah, I really noticed that actually. I, that's not something I knew, but. Um, when I was helping this dragonfly that you just saw the video of to safety out of the wind, it was it was really struggling to to move. To I was I was trying to help it onto like a branch so that it could protect itself, but couldn't couldn't manage to find its it couldn't it couldn't, it couldn't help its way there. It was just clinging on for dear life. Um, okay, so Izzy Rose is saying there was a lot more oxygen around. Pangolin was saying there used to be a lot more oxygen as well. Exactly. So. Back um, a long, long time ago, there used to be a lot more oxygen, and so it was a lot easier for, for insects to grow a lot larger um, because insects don't have the same circulation system as we do. So your circulation system is something you learn all about at school, about how the heart pumps blood around your body, and the reason it does that is that it allows you to get oxygen that you breathe into all kinds of parts of your body and insects don't have anything anywhere near as sophisticated as this going on. And so they, they've got really small as the level of oxygen in the atmosphere has dropped. But back in the day, there used to be so much oxygen that they were absolutely enormous. Um, uh, another cool thing about dragonflies that I found out quite recently is that if you are trying to make a drone, so you know how drones at the moment are made of like a couple, like four propellers normally, um, and then you've got the drone body on the, on the middle, We've recently realized that drones would be far more efficient if we designed them in the same way as dragonflies. So instead of giving them four propellers, if we gave them four wings as well, they'd be far faster at turning corners. They'd be far faster overall. They'd be quicker at going backwards and forwards, accelerating and, and stopping and everything. Um, and so there's a lot of research going into making drones that are designed with the model of a dragonfly, which will be pretty cool. Um, now, before I start talking about soil, it's, this has just reminded me of something else. Does anyone know the word for when we engineer stuff um, where, that is inspired by nature? When we try to try to create things that are, that are inspired by things from nature. Um, and while I'm waiting to see if anyone knows what that word is, um, I'll just 
quickly um, re-welcome people. If you're joining late, thanks so much for coming. This is the name High Live, and so you can ask questions whenever you want. Uh, we're going to be doing Can Soil Save Our Species? Just throw questions in whenever, and I'll, I'll see if I can take them. Uh, and uh, and do, do get involved with answering in the chat. If you are watching on Facebook, then you will find that you can't see what most people are saying. So do come to the website, which is here, um, if you want to see what most people are saying. And if you want to interact, then you need to get a Twitch account so that you can type in comments, but also don't worry if you'd, if you'd prefer to just watch. Um, okay, so uh, Pangolin said bioengineering, one million sloths biocopying, which is almost right. And I think I saw it, yeah, Pumpkin Master said biomimicry. So it's called biomimicry when you um, kind of try and copy something in the, in the wild that's doing something amazing. So, um, well, I say the wild, I don't like to think of us as too separate from nature because we're not. We are very much a part of nature and we need to start thinking that way. Otherwise, it will bring about our doom if we keep thinking of ourselves as somehow separate and special. Um, something I'm thinking of is a, is a little beetle that is in the desert that um, there is an amazing BBC clip where they showed the beetles kind of standing on these foggy dunes and they collect water on their backs because they've got this incredible surface on their backs that water condenses on and sticks to and a lot of work has been going into trying to mimic this material that's on the back of the beetles so that um, people can get more drinking water who live in very hot uh, arid climates try and pull this pull water out of the air um, and so far all of these attempts have been completely unsuccessful and the beetles are still completely dominating and we we are not um but the the main the other biomimicry that i wanted to ask people about was was this um how can we make uh propellers or or the thing that propels a boat forwards more efficient so there's something that we could replace propellers with on the back of a boat and we could make the boats about i think it's about 15 percent more efficient so with with quite a lot less energy, you could you could do the same journeys. Okay, so pangolin saying fins. Uh, one million sloths is saying it needs a top hat. Top hat's not going to propel the boat, but if you're insisting on putting a top hat on the dragonfly, then that can be done. Oh, actually, that top hat really suits that dragonfly. Um, uh, Izzy Rose is saying some of the technology for waterproof phones comes from butterfly wings, which is cool. Uh, and Pumpkin Master is saying fins as well. Exactly. So if you give the back of a boat a tail like a dolphin tail, um, oops, that's not a very good dolphin tail, and then, and then it, it sloshes up and down or from side to side, that's far more efficient. Now, why do you think we haven't done that yet? What's the challenge? Why is it that we still haven't put fins um, on the back of boats? Why have we not put flippers on the back of boats? What do you... um, so why do you think that we... Um... So yeah, it, it would be great if we could use flippers or like dolphin fins on the back of a boat because it'd be so much more efficient. But why do we not do that? Can any, does anyone know the reason why we, why we don't replace um, propellers with, with flippers, even though we know that flippers on the back of a boat would be way more efficient? So Jeff is saying the boat is too big, and that makes sense. Um, and Posija is saying what made the boats faster. So uh, the thing we know from biomimicry is that if we use um, if we use flippers on the back of a boat instead of a propeller, then that will make the boat um, able to go faster and able to move a lot more efficiently. So using less energy to travel the same distance. Um, and one million sloths is saying maybe we don't use flippers because they take up too much space. Um, and vendable sugar is saying it's hard to make. And that's the key point. It's really hard to make these uh, flippers. You need to get some kind of material that's strong enough to repeatedly be flipping up and down inside the water. And it's all about the strength of the material. So we know in theory that flippers would be best on the back of all our boats, but we haven't made materials that are strong enough yet to make them. So in the future, we'll probably be having flippers on the back of our boats. Anyway, right, let's talk about soil. So um, heading down here, First question to you um, guys, what is the shape of a rain droplet? What shape is rain? Okay, so the pumpkin master has come straight in with the right answer saying that rain is perfectly spherical, which is true. 
So a lot of people think that a rain droplet is like this because it might be trailing behind as it falls, but no, it's going at a constant speed because it's already reached terminal velocity. So for those of you who have or have not done this yet in physics, that means that the downward force, the weight, is exactly equal to the upward force, the air resistance, and so there's no overall force. So the two completely cancel out, and that means the raindrop is not accelerating. It's just going continually at the same speed, all the forces are balanced, and it's a perfect sphere just falling downwards like that. Um, now, here's the really cool fact about rain, is when do you guys think rain makes the splash? Obviously, we know that rain splashes when it falls in a puddle, but when does the splash begin? Pumpkin Master is saying, do we know why there's a common belief that it's pear-shaped? And yeah, it's because we think of, um, it was it was something that was made up by people who were guessing that because the wind was blowing past it, it would drag some of the raindrop behind. But that was before we understood more about forces and realized that actually all the forces are balanced, so it must just be a perfect sphere. And Japan Maple's really late, that's fine. Um, okay, so, Penguin, I've, so I've just asked, when does a rain droplet make the splash when it hits water? Uh, and Pangolin has said, maybe when it bounces upwards. And the answer is no. The raindrop makes the splash before the raindrop even hits the water. So if you look sideways on, the raindrop is falling towards the water, and before it even hits the water, it starts to make the water curve downwards underneath it because there's so much, um, there's so much there's like a pocket of air in front of the rain droplet that is already pushing the water below downwards. So yeah, water, so rain creates a splash before it even hits the water. Uh, anyway, I wanted to talk to you about rain because I wanted to talk about soil and I wanted to use one of my favorite words, which is this word petrichor. Um, who knows what petrichor means? And Pangolin's saying it's like a force field. Yeah, it's so cool, isn't it? Um, so yeah, what does this word petrichor mean? What do you guys think? Japan people saying, is that the smell after rain? Yes. So this is the smell that you get after rain, especially after it hasn't rained for a while. And it happens because rain droplets hit a, hit a solid surface. And as they do so, so let's say they're hitting like, um, ooh, wrong color. Let's say they're hitting like a muddy surface. And when they hit the muddy surface, they will again bounce upwards, but in doing so, they'll bring up loads of tiny, tiny, tiny particles from the muddy surface with them. And these tiny particles will become these smell particles that we call petrichor. And petrichor is one of the best smells in existence. Anyway, right, let's talk properly about the soil instead of talking about petrichor. So um, this situation is one that is very, very bad. However, we've learned to think that this looks good. Now, let's talk about some of the, the hard facts about, about soil and about climate in general. So we've covered this a few times before, and so I guess that you guys will already know. What, what proportion of global topsoil do you guys think is degraded? Some of you are saying how that's such a good smell, Petrichor. It absolutely is, isn't it? It's so good. So Pangolin saying, Pangolin and Izzy Rose both saying half, um, and Japan Maple saying a third. And exactly, it's about a third to a half of, of global topsoil that we think is, is worryingly degraded. Um, and some people say this statistic, that we only have 60 harvests, harvests left before we run out of so before we run out of topsoil. So we've only got 60 harvests left before the topsoil is all gone. Now, of course, this 60 harvests left is a global average. So what does that actually mean? So instead of actually having 60 harvests left, what will be the reality? What do you guys reckon? And meanwhile, while you're telling me what you think the reality will be if we've got 60 years of harvests left, uh, the other thing I wanted to add is that 95% of all of our food comes from soil. Um, you know, we don't actually get that much food from the ocean. So almost all of our food is, is soil derived. And so if we don't look after the soil, then it's pretty obvious how bad things are gonna get. Um, 
Okay, so Pangolin's saying more and others in Japan, maple is saying some places will have a lot less. Exactly. So, and one million slots is saying that soil will go up to a crazy price per gram. Uh, so the fact, so people often say this statistic that we have 60 harvests left before we run out of soil. But the reality means that some places will have far, far fewer than 60, and some places may have longer. Um, but on a, so on average, it's going to be 60 years, but basically some places are going to run out of soil very, very quickly. Now, why is it not just a case of um, if the soil degrades, then, then often we, we're thinking, well, that means it can't grow the plants. What do plants need? And so we know that plants need, um, need the following minerals. They need nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The soil needs these three minerals. So <clears throat> in order to grow plants. So our solution for a long, long time has been, well, we'll just create chemical fertilizers that just put these three things into the um, into the soil. Now, why have we now realized how big a disaster this is? Posey Joe's gonna go and dig up some ground and lock it in a safe. Great idea. Pangolin is saying natural decay in the soil cannot be de de cannot be replaced. Yes. So for a long, long time, we have thought of the soil as just being um, this material that contains these nutrients that, that the plants need. And it's only recently that we are starting to understand the huge amount of stuff that goes on inside this space. There is so much alive in here and I really wanted to, um, sorry this is part of, part of this starting late, but I, I really wanted to, to show you guys some videos of, of what is going on inside the soil um, in terms of all the tiny little living things that are crawling around in there. Um, and how it's an entire ecosystem. I think it was recently published in the BBC how one single teaspoon of soil contains um, many millions of living things. And this is completely true. Now, if you keep dumping three basic chemicals in massive excess on a huge ecosystem of living things, what happens to them? So there's some great comments here from Jeff saying there's no mold and Japan saying Japan maple saying there's no fungi as well. And those are absolutely key points. Japan maple saying yes. So so they die. So adding adding the success of NPK results in the all of the organic living things in the soil dying off. And then the soil becomes what we always thought it was, but actually wasn't. It becomes just a, an, an empty, unliving medium that contains NPK for us to grow our plants. For such a long time we've been thinking with a plant-centric mind, and this is something that I've talked about on a, on a live before, and now we're finally starting to realise that we need to focus on keeping the soil alive. Um, because modern farming techniques can ultimately destroy soil now within a matter of, of like a single decade, if they are as intensive as they, as they can be. Now, when the organic matter disappears from the soil because it all starts to die off, there's not just the problem that the soil dies. What, what, what physically changes about the soil? Can you guys, and maybe you've felt soil that feels like really, um, really dead, uh, and, and maybe not, but, but see if you can think what physically happens to the soil as, as all the organic matter in it starts to disappear. Um, so the pumpkin master is saying, is this problem fixable or is it a matter of time until we have no soil? And pumpkin master, yeah. This this problem is completely fixable. Um, it's just it's like, you know, you look at places that uh, have been completely dominated by humans, and then for some reason humans have to leave. So like take Chernobyl for example, uh, and then it's only a matter of decades before all the living things that used to live there then move back in, because the, these things have not been driven to extinction. The living things that exist within the soil they're still there. Um, it's just that they're really, really struggling. But the sooner we just stop meddling and just allow the soil to be what it was always supposed to be, the sooner it will, it will begin to, to fix itself. Now, current thinking is that it takes, um, oh, I can't remember the exact time frame, but I know that it's basically the length of civilization, so about 5,000 years, multiple times over in order to recover some of them some of the most degraded topsoil in the world so we are talking thousands and thousands of years for a lot of the topsoil to come back 
but there are ways of accelerating it. So there are certain crops that we can um, help to grow, but as long as we do so in a way where we're actually creating diversity and we're actually mixing together different crops instead of just creating more of a problem by not thinking with nature first. So um, I met a guy at Oxford who, who is really keen on, on planting loads of succulents uh, all over degraded soil in Africa. Succulents are those plants that have the really like jelly, jelly-like thick leaves because those are particularly good at growing on degraded soil and particularly good at bringing life back to the region. And I know this looks a little bit like coral. Um, it's not supposed to be coral, but there are, there are ways that we can grow, grow different kinds of succulents to try and recover the soil more rapidly. That's one thing. Um, the other thing that we can do is we can trick the soil into thinking that it's in a forest. And I wanna, I'm gonna talk to you about that in, in just a moment because that, that's the key idea, is how we trick soil into thinking it's in a forest. But before we do, I just wanted to see if anyone came upon the physical change of soil when it loses all the life. So Posey Joe says it goes crusty and dusty. Jeff, Jeff says it's becoming like sand and the Japan people are saying similar kind of thing. Exactly. So degraded soil starts to become a lot like sand. I'm just going to move to this like to this map of Japan. Uh, yeah, degraded soil becomes a lot, a lot looser. And when the wind gets up or floods arise, then it will just blow the soil away or wash the soil away. And so you not only lose the life in the soil, but you also lose the soil itself when the life disappears. Because the soil, this, like we have to stop thinking of soil as a useful medium that we use at, for our own benefit as humans. It's not that, it's a living thing that we have to learn to cooperate with. And if we can't learn to live with it in harmony, then we will destroy it. Um, so yes, lifeless soil becomes dusty and, and, and crusty and dry and we'll just, and we'll just blow away and be very, very loose and useless. Um, uh, so yes, I wanted to talk to you about how to trick soil into thinking it was in a forest. And, uh, first I just thought I'll show you this map of Japan. So I think that maybe we spoke about this a little bit before, but, um, there was a cool experiment done where people created a large uh, map of Japan and they put large, large amounts of food around where the big cities are. So they put like large concentrations of food uh, around where the big cities are, like this and this and so on. Um, and then they just put a few bits of fungus all over the map and they waited and they waited to see how the fungus spread and developed. What did the fungus do as it spread across the map of Japan that was covered in food where the big cities were? We also had smaller bits of food, we had smaller cities. LDBR is saying that I've got my own pet, living soil. Yeah, and that's the thing, like soil is essentially a pet. And if anything, actually that's quite genius. We should really start getting people to think of soil as being a pet. Maybe that's some maybe that's something we should do. Oh my god, okay, if people are actually going to keep soil as a pet, can you send send in photos to the Instagram? Because I want to see see what it's like, how, uh, how keeping soil as a pet uh, is going for people. Because, you know, if you give it too much water, then it'll become water waterlocked. And if you give it too many nutrients, then you basically need to balance the, the fungus and the bacteria and all the living things. And that would be great if people can actually do that. Um, and also it teaches how to regenerate soil. So has anyone said what they think happens in Japan when the fungus spreads across Japan? <laughs> Posey Jane is going to go walk their soil. Um, <laughs> the perfect gram of soil. That's what I want. That's what I want. I want to set up like a, a crufts, but instead of for dogs, it's going to be, what should we call it? Crusts? Um, I want the best soil. Uh, and <laughs> and it'll get out of hand and loads of really, really posh people will get involved and uh, there'll be people uh, obsessing over what pedigree soil will mean and it's going to be brilliant. Okay, so Japan was saying, does the fungus gravitate towards where the food is? So yes, on this map of Japan, uh, the fungus moved towards the, the places where there was food, but that was just what it did to begin with. What it did next was totally amazing it started to build connections between where the food was that so closely mimicked Japan's own transport network that 
people suddenly realised how intelligent fungus is in its incredible ability to link together efficiently um, the like parts of its own network. So, you know, we spend huge amounts of time trying to plan how transport systems should work uh, when we know that actually they often evolve in the best way if we, if we just kind of allow them to. Um, but if we just created a map of where we wanted the transport network to be, threw a load of fungus onto it and simulated where we wanted the fungus to link up with large amounts of food, then the fungus would make the map for us and would make an incredibly efficient transport network without us having to do any work or any calculations of our own. Because fungi are unbelievably brilliant at, at connecting places together. Um, okay, so uh, just quickly, I wanted to talk to you about the some of the stuff that I learned one of the last times that I went to Oxford about about soil and how you can use it to um, and, how, and how you can bring it back quickly or how you can create very healthy soil very, very quickly. And for those who want to keep soil as a pet, these will also be important tips for you. So so here we go. Um, and and also, sorry, before I go on about this, uh, keeping um, restoring soil even if they were just doing it on a small scale with people keeping soil as a pet now which is great uh they um the this is this is really important on a global scale because one of the things i haven't talked about a huge amount is the fact that all these living things that we talked about inside the soil that are being killed off by modern farming methods as i've spoken to you about before living things are an incredible carbon sink and there's soil all over the planet, potentially full of far more living things than it is now. And people are constantly thinking, where's the magic machine that will pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere? And the magic machine is, is there. The magic machine is, is right there. It's soil. That's what we need. That is the thing that can pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and create far more healthy ecosystems. And not only will it, will it sequester carbon into itself, but when it's healthy, it will grow far larger plants and things that will also in turn lock up their own carbon. And when they've locked up their own carbon, they, in too, they too in turn will bring in lots more living things that can then inhabit the forest or the, or the, um, or the marshland or the, or the wetland or whatever it may be. But these things all start with soil because soil is the base upon which all of this begins. And so can soil save our species? Absolutely. It's actually probably the key thing in the natural world that we really need to start thinking about if we're actually going to build on top of it and try to turn things around. Okay, so um, how to... Okay, so basically I'm going to just run you through this quite quickly. So soil, the best way to, to keep it really fertile um, and there's a lot more on top of this in terms of different plants that you can use, but I'll just give you the basic ingredients. So if you get some soil uh, from outside, because you've got to start with some so, some soil from, from nearby, then what you need to do is combine the soil with a um, small amount of compost. So you're allowed to you're allowed to like buy in a bit of compost from a shop because that's going to be really useful in terms of introducing some of the key bacteria. So I'm not so obviously you could just buy all all compost and then you've instantly got loads of really really nutritious soil but that would be cheating. So you've got to get a small amount of compost and the idea is to make the soil that you've brought in from the outside be as nice and and um and uh, loamy. Loamy is such a good word. So the aim is to make make your soil from outside wherever you've gathered it from nice and loamy similar to the to the compost that you've that you've got. Um uh Okay, so the other thing though, because this is what people often do, but the one thing that people really miss out is wood chips. So you've got to get small pieces of wood. Now, the ideal, I can't remember the exact measurement, but I think it's about eight, like seven or eight centimeters. But if you can find um, some branches of tree, like willow or something like that, that are around like seven or eight centimeters across, and then you just chop the branches into wood chips and then you deposit all these wood chips into an area um, of the soil as well. Then these wood chips create the perfect fuel for fungus. Because one of the things that, we, that we've really not taken into account when we've been trying to look after soil over the past few decades is fungus. We, you know, we give it compost. 
um, because we know that compost contains nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, and so on. Um, but we often, but we've for a long time forgotten how important fungus is. And you feed the fungus using chips of wood. Now, the reason I'm I'm telling you that you need to use um, wood that's not super thick and not super thin is that you need to get a good ratio. Um, you need to get a good ratio. You need to get a ratio between the outer part of the wood chips. So this outer bit is called the cambium. And this outer bit contains a lot of the um, a lot of the nutrients that again, like the, the bacteria will use. Um, but then the woody matter on the inside is what the fungus will, will thrive from. And having a good ratio between those two is what you really need in order to stimulate the fungal growth, but also the bacterial growth and the other small organisms that live in the soil. So, um, so you need to get some wood chips basically, and you need to experiment with different kinds of wood chips to try and stimulate really nice fungus in your soil. And you will know because it will start to smell in such a way that you will smell it and think this is a really great smell. And the reason I think it's great is because of this primitive thing inside of me where for hundreds of thousands of years, humans have known what fertile soil smells like because we've known, oh, we're approaching a really fertile forest and this is gonna be good for us because we're gonna be able to find food in here. So you will recognize the smell, even if you've never learned it before, because it, it must be part of our, our instinct somehow to, to recognize this, this smell. Um, so yeah, for looking after your pet, pet soil, this is, this is how you do it. Um, we're gonna have to finish because I'm like massively overrunning. Uh, but I just wanted to show you this, this horrible picture of, of deforestation and just show you that things are still going completely the wrong direction. Still, when people have run out of places to farm their animals because the soil is degraded, instead of thinking, wow, the soil keeps degrading, we need to look after it, the response continues to be, well, over there has good soil under that forest, let's chop the whole forest down and build our farm here instead. And then when this is degraded, we'll chop that bit down and so on. And this is the main thing driving forest destruction and soil degradation the world the world over is is intensive farming and so that's something we really need to fight against now um if you have been interested in this and you want to find out more then do check out my film which is called disappearing um oh no which is called losing ground um which you can find by just searching losing ground on online um and maybe search my name as well but yeah, Losing Ground is the name of the film and that tells you loads more about soil if you want to find out more and do spread the word about it. Um, I will uh, also, um, yeah, do please follow our socials, Aim High Live, uh, which you can find on TikTok now as well. And sign up for our schedule on the website up here if you haven't already. And if you'd like to give us feedback, that'd be great. You can do that just below the stream if you're watching on the website. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, I will see you guys again tomorrow. Farewell. Bye.